Hi, in this video we're going to look at the definition of limit of vector valued functions. So here in this box I have written definition of limit for real valued functions. So these would be the kind of functions you worked with in calculus 1 and also probably calculus 2. So we've got an ordinary y equals f of x function and this definition of limit in the box here should look pretty familiar to you. Depending on the textbook you might have used for calculus 1, maybe there were some slight different wordings or slightly different symbols that were used, but this is a pretty standard definition you can find in most textbooks. So we've got a function defined on some interval around x equals a, so open interval i containing x equals a except possibly at that point, at x equals a. Uh, we're defining in this definition what it means for that limit to be a real number, so our l here is a real number, that's what this definition is about. Uh, and then it says if for every epsilon greater than zero there exists a delta greater than zero such that, and then there's an implication, x is in the interval around a, around a and uh, 0 is less than absolute value of x minus a less than, then there's a blank, so hopefully you can think about what goes in the blank, implies the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than another blank, we say that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l. So hopefully it doesn't take you too long to think about what goes in those blanks. Uh, so, the first blank here is the delta when x is within delta units of a but not at x equals a, that's what the zero represents there. Uh, if we're guaranteed that the function outputs will be within epsilon units of l, that's what it means to say that we have the limit. Alright, so part of the reason I put that there is that I want to think about what aspects of that would need to be different if we're going to think about being able to define definition of what it means to think about the limit of a vector valued function. So first of all, our vector valued functions generally use t for the input variable, so we're going to have the limit as t approaches some number. Remember that our inputs for vector valued functions are numbers, intervals of numbers, and thinking about what that limit should be and thinking about how we should define that. So uh, the other important thing to think about in this definition for real valued functions, the f of x and l, so those are really about outputs of the function. L might not be an output of the function, but this last statement that I highlighted here, absolute value of f of x minus l, is really about the outputs of the function getting close to l, so that's really about outputs of functions. And so if we think about our vector valued function, and what the outputs of that vector valued function should be, it should make sense to you that I can't just write an L here. Outputs of vector valued functions are vectors, so we would expect that we're going to be getting close to a vector, so it would be important to note that that L in this case is going to have to be a vector in order for this to make sense. Okay, so let's go ahead and write the definition. So it should be pretty parallel to what we had before here. We just want to kind of emphasize what's going to need to be different here when we have a different kind of function that has really different kinds of outputs than our ordinary function. All right, so first of all, we want our function, in this case r, uh, we want that function to be defined uh, all around t equals a, so we could say here on some open interval, containing t equals a, but really the power of limits is that we don't need the function to actually be defined at that point, so except possibly 
at t equals a itself. All right, so that's really just parallel. Uh, we want to think about the differences here. Our function is a vector valued function, and we've got that input variable that's t instead of x, but other than that, what I wrote here is pretty much just the same thing we had before. All right, the next part's going to have to be a little bit different. Our l here is not going to be a real number. It's going to represent a vector, and that will be a vector in whatever space our outputs are for this vector valued function. So I'm just going to put here in Rn, so that might be in R2, R3, depending on uh, the outputs of our vector valued function and how those are defined. All right, so that's one difference here, uh, that we've got a vector instead of an ordinary number that we're talking about here that our function outputs are approaching. All right, this next part here uh, is going to be the same if for every epsilon greater than zero, uh, there exists a delta. Such that. All right, and then this next line is really kind of the workhorse of this limit definition. When you prove statements about limits, uh, this is the kind of workhorse that allows you to prove things. You need to show that this implication is true for whatever you're working on. All right, so this next line here is about inputs at the beginning. Before that implication symbol, we're talking about inputs. So we're going to have here t is in the interval around t equals a, and this next statement is about our inputs being within delta units of a. So in this case, we want our t's to be within delta units of a, but not equal to a. So that part's pretty much the same. I've just used t instead of x here. Uh, we, if that implies that the next part, because the outputs of the function are going to be different, uh, we need to think about this a little bit more. So in the original definition here, we've got bars, and those bars really represent absolute value bars. So the absolute value of the difference between the function outputs and L. Here though, because we have a vector function, uh, we're going to have vector function outputs, which are vectors, and L, which is a vector, and so here we have a difference of two vectors, so we get a vector. And so in this case, when we talk about those vectors being close together, and we put these bars here, these bars here are going to be magnitude of a vector, magnitude of the difference between those two vectors. The difference between those two vectors is a vector. So uh, whenever t is in our interval and t is within delta units of a, if we're then guaranteed that the outputs of the function are within epsilon units of that L vector, uh, that's what it means to say that the limit as t approaches a of r of t is equal to L. So our output functions, uh, outputs of this function vectors will be very close to the vector that we claim our function is approaching. So there's another big difference here that that's really magnitude of a vector in that part. Uh, the only other minor difference here was about t using t instead of x. Okay, so that's the definition. I want you to be able to answer concept questions about that, understanding how it's di similar and different from the definition of limit for a real valued function. Um, but when you calculate limits of functions, you can use this theorem to prove things, but you often don't use the theorem so much when you actually calculate those. You use theorems about limits. So we're going to look at a little theorem here that's really powerful and that you'll find really useful. Okay, so this theorem, I've got half of the theorem here. We're going to go ahead and write the rest of it in here. All right, so I've got a vector valued function. You can see that I've got that in R3 here. So I have three components in that vector. And I've given a name to my component functions, f of t, g of t, and h of t. And we've got L1, L2, and L3 being real numbers. And then I have a statement here about limit as t approaches a of this f of t. So that f of t is an ordinary kind of function, a scalar function 
where the f of t inputs real numbers and outputs real numbers. So that's a real valued function. And same with our g of t and h of t here. So these are ordinary limits like you would have done in kind of calc 1. And so if I know that the limit as t approaches a of that i component function in the x direction is L1, and then in the j direction, uh, limit as t approaches a of g of t is L2, and limit as t approaches a of h of t is L3, what we would like to happen is to be guaranteed then that the limit of the original vector valued function would just be the limit of those each of those components and in fact that statement of that theorem is true so I'm not actually proving that theorem here I'm just kind of writing it down here but what this says is that when you're actually calculating limits of vector valued functions you can calculate the limits on each component and if you know each of those then that tells you the limit of the overall function. So you're really just doing that component by component. And in fact, this is a really powerful theorem. It's an if and only if theorem. It works both ways. So yeah, you would really need to prove that to show that it works both ways. But you get a double implication here. So that means if you know one statement, you get the other statement for free. So this is a really powerful theorem. And essentially, when you find limits of vector valued functions, what it says that you can do is just really focus on working on component by component. And that's going to be really important when we do calculus, because all of the other big powerful things that you do in calculus, like derivatives and integrals, uh, but we're going to be starting with derivatives. Derivatives really are limits. So when we think about derivatives of vector valued functions, uh, we're going to be connecting back to this idea of limits of vector valued functions. And because the limits, this theorem tells us that the limits can be done component by component. So I'm just really thinking about one component at a time is what this theorem is saying. Uh, then that's going to allow us to think about derivatives and then antiderivatives and even definite integrals component by component. Just really thinking about uh, what this theorem tells us to do. Okay, in the next video we're going to look at some examples of finding a limit of a vector valued function and then get on to some other things like derivatives and integrals.